The next question comes from one of your longtime supporters. Um, He's fascinated with this new discovery of the oldest spiritual site ever found. It's older than Stonehenge. It's 12,000 years old. And the interesting thing about it is that archaeologists have found that this hunter-gatherer civilization from that point in history became a farming settlement, which then gave rise to a need for spirituality and the recognition of a higher being. This place is called Gobekli Tepe. It is in Turkey. And there are it's a very sophisticated civilization that is the oldest, uh, contains the oldest temple or spiritual site ever found. Um, what is your, it, basically what he wants to know is, what is your insight on that? It's a complete um, switch in how hunter-gatherers uh, just roaming nomadically carried on, uh, gathered, they gathered together now, there was farming, there was something that brought them together where they'd need to cooperate, and now they're building a, a temple or something to recognize a higher being. What would your insight be on that if you have one? Well, I will take it from two opposite directions. And the one direction is that, you know, humans have always had a sense of being part of something bigger. That's just a part of us. And they've always had an inclination to try to improve themselves. And that's just a, a thing. I mean, it's, it is true. We are consciousness. We're part of a larger consciousness system. And we have a, an awareness of that fact that we, you know, there is something larger than just us. We're not, we're not the whole game. There's something more. There's purpose. You know, there, there's value to us other than, you know, what we do. There's value to us in our, in our being and the quality of our being, you know, morality, doing things for the right reason. All that's been around forever, so certainly much, much longer than 12,000 years. You know, that's just a fundamental awareness we have, whether it's in our intellect or not. We've got that idea, same idea we have that we should better ourselves. We should improve. We should grow up. That's part of us as consciousness. We just get that at an intuitive level. So that's always been around. So there's always been people who have uh, had you know, spiritual concepts or ideas that blossomed into groups, that blossomed into organizations, that blossomed into temples, you know, that sort of thing. That's been with us much longer than the 12,000 years. It's innate. Now, on the other hand, I have done a lot of uh, traveling around uh, in the Southwest at old ruins, old cliff dwellings, things like that. And after listening to the guides tell me about all what all the stuff is and, and what it meant and how it was used and so on, I've come to the conclusion that archaeologists and others who, who uh, are, are the professionals in this, when they come to something that they really just can't fathom, they can't understand it. Every one of these houses has a little hole in the ground right over here in this right, you know, in the northwest corner of this of all these homes, it's just this hole in the ground. It's about two feet deep and, you know, a foot in diameter, and there it is. And they have no idea, you know, did they keep roots in there? Or, you know, was that a, what was that? And uh, if they can't figure out anything, the, f the last answer is, had some religious significance. I think that's a basket where everything gets tossed in that they don't understand, because it must have had some sort of religious significance. Because I've been through all of these dwellings and people would point out things and say, oh, well, that was for some sort of religious significance. And I'd say, well, why? What did they do there? What was the religious significance? What, what was the point? Well, we don't know. And it's like, well, and how do you know it was for religious significance? Well, because we can't think of anything else was, was the answer. So I'm a little dubious sometimes about, you know, things that are 12,000 years old and what's a temple and what's not and what it was used for. Is that just our viewpoint of looking at it 12,000 years later that we says, well, what could this thing be? Maybe they stored grain in there. No, it looks like a temple to me. Um, you know, we're guessing. 
So that's one thing. We're just guessing about things like that. So I don't, I'm open-minded, but I'm skeptical. And uh, on the other hand, see, that's the opposite direction. On the other hand, yes, yeah, spirituality has been with us, you know, forever. Spirituality kind of comes with moral choice, you know, things being right and wrong and so on. That's, that's been with us forever. So could be a temple. Surely there, there was uh, groups that had spiritual interests long before 12,000 years ago. And uh, so it wouldn't be surprising that they find evidence of that now. But without looking at it and, and uh, doing other things, I'd be a little skeptical about how much we are able to interpret what actually happened, what the intents were of the beings that used that place. Yes, we see the place, we see the structure, but we can't see the intents of the people that were there very well. So our scientists kind of look at the structure and then guess what the intent was and how that structure was used. 12,000 years, that's a lot of guessing. You know, there's, a, there's kind of a, a, big, uh, a big lap there. They didn't leave any books behind that described, you know, with architectural drawings and arrows pointing here and there about what was going on. So we just kind of make it up what makes sense to us. So that's two opposite directions to look at. Open-minded but skeptical, but spiritual stuff going on 12,000 years ago is not surprising at all. Spiritual stuff going on a million years ago wouldn't be surprising. Very good. Thank you. Um, since we brought up intent, the next question from Shaw is a question about modifying probabilities with intent. I recently watched an older interview with you and another scientist, Anthony Peake, uh, hosted by Vincent Eastwood. The subject of modifying probabilities came up and you talked a bit about how that works, stating that with intent you can modify the probability of a particular outcome. After that, Anthony briefly mentioned something about how several probabilities could be changed with a focused intent and then the subject quickly changed to something else. It got me thinking, for something as simple as random number generators, there's only one probability which needs to be changed. So your intent may get you the results you were intending, or it may not, but there's only one probability being modified. Um, other, other teachings, such as Law of Attraction, which you mentioned during the Calgary uh, lecture, you, you had said that that is real. Uh, let's say you were focusing on your intent on something a bit more abstract than a random number generator. I use like financial success for an example, as that often comes up in the law of attraction. Um, so if you're fo focusing your intent on having wealth, uh, it is possible that thousands, millions, or billions of tiny probabilities would be changed over a period of time in order to glide you towards what you were intending to manifest. Um, is that possible? If you get very good at focusing your intent, could countless little things happen on a daily basis to cause you to reach your goals much faster, such as bumping into somebody who could help you, finding a key piece of information you needed, and such as that. It seems that you could do a lot more than just modify one probability if countless little things are being changed day in and day out to move you slowly but surely towards your goal. Do you think this is accurate rep representation of how it works? Sure, that's how it works. When you have a when you use your intent to modify probability, it can be as simple as making a you know a random generator generate more you know more lar you know larger numbers rather than smaller numbers, so that the average skews you know to the the larger side or the smaller side. Yeah, that's a very simple thing. But if you want to intend that, you know, some some much more complex interactive thing comes on that, that there's hundreds of people playing in, like the financial success, then all you're doing is you're one player among a hundred, say. So there's a hundred different people that are going to have to connect to get you that financial success. Well, they also have intents and they're also you know, modifying probabilities. And if you're trying to make a probability move to the right and they're trying to make it move to the left, well, it's getting pushed both ways. And it's just like anything gets pushed both ways, you know, it depends on who pushes the most or how many pushers you got on one side against the other. It's force against force. So in a, in a very complex situation where you have lots of intents and probabilities, you will bias the probability toward an outcome. So if the outcome is financial success, 
then there's lots of different little things. Like he says, millions of little steps that are in between that might modify slightly. But there's also people that are also pressing on those same things, and they may not be pressing them in the same direction you do. But you are biasing. You're putting your energy in there to bias it a little bit this way. Whether it actually goes that way or not depends. One, it depends on you know, how much you have to move it. If you have something and it's a million to one that it'll happen and you want it to happen, so you put your mind to it and it goes all the way to one in a thousand, wow, you've really moved it a lot. You know, you'd be very powerful to move it that many orders of magnitude, but it still probably isn't going to happen. It's still one in a thousand, you see. So just because you put your energy into it doesn't guarantee that it's going to happen. All it does is it just it's a nudge. It's a push. It's a bias in that direction. Whether that bias is enough or not, eh. Maybe there's other people pushing on it the other way. Maybe you're the only one pushing on it to make it go right. Maybe there's 20 people pushing on it to make it go left. So it goes left even though you wanted it to go right. It's a very complicated process. Yes, there's lots of things going on, but you do bias it to an outcome. You don't have to just bias it to a particular thing like a random number generator. You bias it to a big outcome that has lots of things that might have to happen, and you bias it that way whether you actually get that to happen or not, it's another thing. It's very complicated when you have very complicated uh, scenarios. So that's all that is, is that your intent biases the probabilities. It doesn't force them. It doesn't require them to do anything in particular. You're just one, one intent among many. And it may work for you or it may not. Now, the larger consciousness system is not all that uh, interested, probably, in your financial success. That's neither here nor there to the larger consciousness system. They're interested in you growing up and learning something. Okay, now if financial success will help you do that because you've been blaming all your trouble on the fact that you were poor all along, it's not me. I'm really a wonderful person. I'm really grown and you know high level conscious, but I just had all this bad luck and I've just been poor. You know, if you're using that as an excuse, well, the system may want to help you get wealthy so you can find out that it's you're the same miserable person, wealthy or poor. It has to do with your quality of consciousness, not how much money you've got. You see, so in that way, the conscious system may actually help you get rich just to make a point. But the, the conscious system doesn't really give a hang, you know, what your bank account looks like. It gives a hang about the choices you make and the quality you make of those choices. And if it knows that uh, you've been wealthy before and every time you've de-evolved because you get greedy and you get nasty and you get possessive, well, you put some energy into being rich, it may put some energy into you not being rich because that's not a good situation for you to be in because you've been there and you've de-evolved over it. So you're not ready for that yet. You're not grown enough for that to be a good learning situation for you. You see, so there's lots of things that are pushing on this situation. It's not just you alone in the in the world of consciousness that wants something to happen so you can make it happen it is not that simple but yes it does work like you say you know it uh, it, it biases to a result but it's just a bias all right the next question from greg is memories of non-physical matter reality being wiped. Um, as he experiments with trying to do things in MPMR, he finds that he's often left with only a memory of something that happened, but no details. Um, this reminds me of Robert Bruce's model of having a duplicate that operates non-physically and has to be reintegrated with a physically oriented mind in order to have the memories available in this waking consciousness. How would you explain this in MBT terms? and? When, when I can integrate with that other part of myself, will I be able to retroactively recover the memories I keep losing at this time? Um, the, the metaphor that, that Robert Bruce is, is uh, using is a good metaphor, but it's just a metaphor. Again, don't take these metaphors too seriously. When you say, well, there's another me that goes out and then we integrate, that's one way of putting it, but that's not an actuality. That's just a metaphor. And it's a good metaphor, you know, for that. Um, you don't bring it back because you don't need it. It's not important to your growth. In other words, you're in a you're in a situation and you've made choices. So you're in a dream, let's say, or you're in some other, you're out of body, you're doing something, 
and you're making choices and those choices are either good ones or bad ones. They help you evolve or de-evolve. The choice has been made. The increment toward more or less entropy has been done. And now you come back and basically it's over. Your intellect doesn't really need to know that. It's all, it's happened. It's, it's a part of your experience base there. But mostly experiences there don't necessarily connect too well to experiences here. The two different reality frames, they have different rule sets and different things, you know, can happen there. So you were in an experience where you, you know, flew somewhere and did something and that doesn't play well here because you don't fly here. You know, you have to take a car or a bus or, you know, do walk. You have to do something else. There you were doing that. So the exact same the memories would kind of be confusing to bring here or they wouldn't be helpful so that's one reason why you don't get them and the other is because you don't pay attention if you are aware of it like in a lucid dream or not a body or in meditation which means your awareness is there all the time then you can bring it back but if your awareness is not there if you're asleep and you're dreaming then you're still doing it but you don't bring it back because your awareness here is not paying attention to that. So it's, you know, and you can call that, well, I have a separate being and that separate being is having the experience and I have to reintegrate it. Yeah. That's a good metaphor. You could, could you get that meta? Could you get all that information back? Possibly, but unlikely. Again, that's where the metaphor starts to take on more reality than it deserves with a metaphor. Okay. I've got this being out there and it's got all that data. If I integrate, then do I get all that data back? Well, that would make sense if that metaphor were taken very uh, literally, but I wouldn't take that metaphor that literally. Probably you're not going to get all that uh, data back because that's kind of water under the bridge. It's already happened and getting that into your intellect isn't going to be that valuable. You've got plenty of choices to make here. You know, you're not in one of choices. It's like, well, I don't have any choices to make here. I'm just sitting in a cave. I never talk to anybody. I never do anything. I never go out. I just sit here in the lotus position and meditate all day, well, then maybe you'd want to remember these things because you wouldn't have any other experience. But most of us have a wealth of choices and experiences happening to us daily. We don't need to, you know, we don't need any more. We're full up of decisions to make and choices to make all the time. It's not like we miss something by not having those other things. So I think it's just not, you know, if it were really important to your growth, it would probably be made to where you would remember those things, but it's not. It, uh, you've got all the choices and all the, you know, you got all the feedback and the information you need. Uh, getting a little more into your intellect isn't going to help because the action really isn't in your intellect. The action's at the being level and that's already been taken care of. Putting it up into your intellect isn't really making a whole lot of difference. A lot of people who live out of their brains, live out of their heads a lot. I say brains, virtual brains, live out of their heads. They kind of have the idea that their intellect does everything. And if it's not in their intellect, it's just sitting fallow on the ground. And it's not useful until they get it in their intellect. They can't get anything out of it. That's not true. Your changes are at your being level. Intellectual, you can learn things in the intellect and it won't help you grow up until you convert that learning at the being level. Again, you can act nice, but it doesn't help you grow unless you become nice unless you be nice just acting won't do it so the intellect isn't really all that important as far as getting information there it is important as far as making the choices and getting it at the being level that's important so i'd say that's probably why you don't get that it's not that it's necessarily wiped on purpose but there's probably not much purpose in it and it's just be extra stuff for you to mind for your intellect to run around with and uh your intellect isn't where the action is. Your intellect just works on the choices you have, and you have plenty of choices to keep it busy. You don't, uh, you don't need those that uh, don't exactly fit well in your reality. So um, that leads me to some questions like about like, like what is awareness? Because um, you know, I can have this sensation that my I guess like my intellect, like my waking intellect that I'm, I'm used to having when I'm awake is aware of something. Or I can have, um, you know, I can have like a, a lucid dream that's like partially lucid or I'm, I'm certainly like aware at the time that these things are happening, 
but my my waking is like might not be uh really operating or switched on or whatever so that's that's not aware so it's like it's like uh i can be aware at the being level or i can be aware at the intellectual level or both or neither like so what uh is that just the way the data is streamed through the consciousness like what is awareness well there are lots of levels to awareness and your intellectual level is probably the least among them and for many people that intellectual level is the only one that exists you know that's the that's the kind of the center of it all but basically you your awareness has a lot to do with what you focus on you can you know you can uh, walk down the same street every day and not realize that there's a certain store there or a certain car that's always parked there there's all kinds of data that you get that you really aren't aware of you don't process it so there's tons of stuff that come to you all the time that never get into your intellect i remember i was driving my my children to school every day and uh I had my my little girl michelle was very observant about her environment and early in the morning driving the kids to school i was just awake enough to drive the car safely and Sometime in a conversation, you know, uh, much later, she was talking about, uh, you know, we were talking about painting a house or doing something. And she pointed out, yeah, like the like the shutters on the house down the street that are painted purple. And I'm going, what? She said that. And I said, really? She says, yeah. Well, the next time we went out, I looked and darn if they weren't. But I'd been down that street 100 times, maybe 200 times. And I couldn't have told you there were purple shutters on that house. I just never noticed. You see, it never got into my intellect. Sure, light reflected from them into my eyeballs, but you know it didn't uh, didn't make an impression on me until they were pointed out to me. So there's you know awareness has to do a lot with your focus. What are you aware of? What you're focused on? It doesn't necessarily have to do with what's in your intellect. Sometimes you focus that awareness with your intellect, and your intellect focuses. And if I went to every house and stared at it long enough to try to memorize, you know everything about it that probably would have been then in my intellect but i didn't so it wasn't so awareness is you as consciousness your intellect is well let's put it this way your awareness is a piece of you as a big consciousness part of the larger consciousness system that's kind of your fundamental awareness but besides that there's this little piece that is also your intellect in this app you know tied to this avatar but that's a little subset of the whole. So you've got other parts of your awareness that are doing things that are aware that have maybe focus of their own that's going on. And your little intellectual piece, this is what you're aware of. Your little C consciousness is just a piece of a, of a larger picture of you. And you don't always, you don't always get everything that's going on. For instance, one of the things you can do is you can set up a, you can set up a conditional. I've probably mentioned this in other times. If you, if there's somebody that needs your help and they happen to be in a different time zone than you, so when they need the help, they're unlikely to call you because it'd be in the middle of the night. You can say something like when, you know, if you need my help, maybe you're healing them or doing something. You can say, if you need my help, just call, call my name and I'll come to help you. I'll give you some boost or something. And you set that up as an intent and you focus on that and you keep that in the back of your mind as intent. If this person calls, go help them, whatever it is they need, try to help them out. That will happen. And you will get feedback. The person says, oh yeah, you know, I had this problem the other day and I called on you and thank you very much. I got relief immediately. And you won't have any idea that you ever got called on, you see, because you set up that intent and it doesn't have to do with that little piece of consciousness that's your little C and you know your awareness, your intellect. It has to do with some a bigger picture than that. So, you know, awareness is bigger than just your intellect. You have awareness at, at a lot of levels. Your being level is one. That's why people have uh, a subconscious, because they have awareness at a being level and suddenly something happens and they get angry and they don't really know why. Well, where'd that come from? Well, there was some awareness at the being level that did an interpretation that created anger. And uh, that happens, not in your intellect. Um, you have, uh, you know, the stuff you do with your dreams. If you try, you can remember a lot more of your dreams. You start a dream log. You know, you start paying attention to your dreams. 
suddenly you remember 10 times more than you did if you never paid any attention to your dreams. If you ignore your dreams, you get little bits and pieces sometimes. If you pay attention to them, you'll get full feature length, you know, technicolor dreams, you know, every night. You keep that dream log will, will be full, you know, every night you'll put stuff in it. So it just depends on what you focus on as to what comes into your intellect. But don't confuse your intellect with your consciousness or with your awareness, either one. Your awareness and your consciousness are much bigger than your intellect. And often they're doing their own thing on their own time. But it has, you know, it, it, like, like setting up that conditional. It, it's still you. It's just not the intellect you. So does that mean, um, like in the example you're giving about uh, setting the conditional to heal someone else, does that mean that if, if your intellect was not aware of, of that, going out and doing that, that that piece would be aware on its own, like having its own subjective awareness? And this actually goes directly into one of my other questions that I had. Does that mean that then in, in that instance in time that there's, there's two subjective awarenesses and are these subjective awarenesses even discrete numbers that we can count or is it something more you know where it just kind of blends between uh like a like a spectrum or something it's different it's different aspects of the same thing it's not two separate things that go in two different boxes it's basically i was just thinking of an analogy i could make with radar systems but that probably would be lost on most people there's, a, there's phased array radars, and they can send multiple beams in multiple directions, or they can send them all in one direction. They can put out as many as 100 different radar beams in different directions, or they can put it all into one big one, you know, someplace else. It's, it depends. They can do that. Well, think of your awareness like that. Your awareness is this, this major beam, if you want, might be in what you call your, your aware, your, your, uh, your intellect. But then there's these other things that can go on too that are not in your intellect, but they're still you. They're still a part of you. Not like they're separate things. We don't put them in a separate box. It's just a different focus of your energy, of your intent. You don't have to have your intellect run everything. People who, particularly left brain people, think their intellect runs everything. Their intellect is the master at the switch, at the control. You know, the intellect is in charge. You can't do anything without the intellect informing, you know, your body or your, your mind or something. Your intellect is the, is the boss. Well, there's, uh, there's other aspects to you besides that intellect. That's just one. And when I set up a conditional, it's me. It's my conscious energy. It's, it's Tom Campbell who's doing the healing. But Tom Campbell, awake, doesn't remember a thing about it. Because Tom Campbell was fast asleep in the middle of the night when that happened. So I don't remember anything about it. And they say, oh, thanks a lot. Do you remember that? You know, and I say, oh, I don't remember. I don't have anything about it. But I've had that happen to me so many times that I know that it works. And there's a part of your consciousness, just like another beam going someplace else, not the intellect. It's another part of your energy that's being projected somewhere else. It's like my daughter. Some of her energy was projected into looking at those shutters and seeing what color they were. None of mine was. See, none of my focus was there. So it just, as far as I know, you know, there were no shutters on the house, much less what color they were. This wasn't in my reality frame, wasn't in my intellect. I couldn't have told you if you'd asked me, does that house have shutters? I said, I have no idea. All I can tell you is I think it's made out of brick. You know, it probably has a roof on it. You know, those are about all I could tell you about it because I just didn't look at the details, even though I've been, I've seen it hundreds and hundreds of times. I wasn't focused on it. So you can focus on things and not focus on things. And your intellect is just that subset that you focus your, you know, your intellectual awareness on, but there's more of you in that. You're a multi-dimensional being. You have more to you than just your intellect working in this avatar. You have, you have often, you have an intuition. And that intuition downloads information and you have no idea where that information comes from. Like magic, just the piece of information you need just happens to appear when you need it. And uh, where did that come from? Wasn't anything I knew. I didn't dig that up out of my memory. You know, where is that? And it's just because there's other parts of you out gathering the information you know, not because you intellectually went out to get the information. It just comes to you intuitively. So again, that's another one of those beams going out and 
getting stuff you need or going out and helping somebody or going out and looking at what the shutters, how the shutters are painted. And you've got these things that, that are going on all the time and only a piece of it actually gets into your intellect. Okay, Tom, the next question has to do with uh, playing the game. On one hand, we live in a simulation which is convincing enough that most people believe it's the totality of reality. Well, just ask any mainstream physicist, right? right. And this level of illusion is considered <laughs> a feature of the system because it keeps us focused on our lessons. In this sense, being immersed in the illusion can be seen as beneficial. On the other hand, most spiritual growth systems are about seeing beyond the illusion and understanding reality for what it really is. So do you agree with these statements? Is so, is there a, if so, is there a dichotomy here, perhaps on purpose? If not, what am I getting wrong? No, I agree. That is the way it is, and uh, that is the most efficient way to do it. Um, growth, spiritual growth, connecting, you know, they talk about... Uh, you know, and it's been pretty much from recorded time. You know, people get together and they have uh, connections spiritually, and they they have. Um, what do we say I don't know quite exactly how he put it, but anyway, you have these uh, uh, people who go beyond the illusion of a physical reality, and they understand that, and they get uh, information from it. I mean, people have been downloading information from databases, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, way, way back before we have any, any record of it, because we're consciousness and that's part of what we do. So that has become an awareness of people who are ready for that awareness. People who are not ready for that awareness don't, you know, don't go there. There's no point of dragging somebody to a point where they can't process the information. They're not ready to, to use it in a beneficial way. They would use it, perhaps, if there was some way they could use it in a not beneficial way. They would use it to increase their entropy, but not to decrease it. So when you get to the point where your search for truth, for meaning, for significance, for, you know, how does things really work? When, that, when, when you need to find these things out, that means you are ready, probably, to find these things out. When you couldn't care less about any of that stuff and think it's all a bunch of malarkey, you're probably not ready to find those things out and deal with them effectively in a way that you can learn from them and grow from them. Right now, if it were, it kind of brings up the psi uncertainty principle, you know, if it were widely known across the whole population that you could modify intent, I mean, uh, modify future probability with intent, See, most people, if you told them that, they'd go, yeah, yeah, some kind of, you know, what are you, a new age, uh, you know, wacko or something. They wouldn't take it very seriously. They'd just put it off. If they took that seriously, if somebody told them that and they really thought that was the case, how many people would be, you know, jumping on the, um, on the bandwagon of let's use that to get rich. Let's use that to get a promotion. Let's use that to hurt the people we don't like. Let's use that for our advantage you know, against other people. Let's use that to, to win the race. And uh, that would all be negative. That would all be de-evolutionary kinds of choices to make. But people who are at that level of consciousness, that's what they'd think. They'd say, well, how do you use it? How can I use that? I want people to agree with me. Can I use my intent to bias, you know, the way they see things? Well, you know, I'll start controlling all the reality around me. Let me learn how to do this. You know, I'm going to go to meditation classes. I'm going to learn how to get good at it. I'll practice until I can manipulate things the way I want them. We don't want people to go there because they can practice and they can get better at it, you see, but they don't, they're not grown up enough to be there. We don't want them, you know, if you want to say, you know, to know, to take that path. They will when they're ready. And when they're ready, it's available to them. It's all around us. When they get to the point they're grown up enough to deal with it, then they will be drawn to it. And they'll learn. Still, we'll get some, um, some of the people that don't belong will be get here anyway. But that's a small minority, and that's okay. We can deal with those. But that's sort of why it works that way. Yes, it's a good, it's a good thing that it's, that it's that way. 
All right, the next question. Universal feedback to subjective viewpoints. How is feedback universal if viewpoints are subjective? As a system provides feedback to individuals based on their behavior in order to encourage lowering of entropy, what is preventing an individual from subjectively interpreting negative feedback as positive or vice versa? Nothing. That's the thing. The, the individual gets the data, they get to interpret any way they want. You know, you can uh, give them information that's very helpful to them and they can reject it. And um, you can give them information that's, you know, that's not helpful to them and they can accept it or vice versa. You see, they have free will. There's nothing to make sure that uh, if the system tries to nudge them towards something that's good for them that, or something that would help them grow, that they'll actually see it, grab that, grab that opportunity and make something of it. They may turn their head the other way, walk off without ever, uh, you know, they may reject that opportunity, which means they're just not ready yet. So generally the system doesn't waste its time trying to nudge people who aren't ready to make something valuable out of the nudge. So typically if you're getting nudged by the system, it's because that nudge is of value to you. So that's why there's lots of people that say, I never had a lucid dream. I've never been out of body. I've never had any synchronicity. I've never had seen anything paranormal. I've never had any of that happen to me. Therefore, I think it's all a bunch of rubbish. It's not part of my experience. And if it was not rubbish, it would be part of my experience. You see, it'd be a part of everybody's experience. If that goes with being human, I'm human. I don't have it. Therefore, it's bogus. Well, it's not always like that. It's selective. You know, if you if you can't use it, generally you don't get it. If you're ready for it, then it's available. So that's, you know, that's sort of why that works that way. The people who can use it, get it. People who don't, are, are, there's no point. Well, so okay, still, that, still on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What? Okay, who was it speaking? I just wanted to uh, ask a uh, follow up to that question. Yes, you have a, another question on subjective viewpoints and two smaller ones. If you'd like to ask those, that'll be fine, Greg. Yeah. Um, okay, so that, that one um, ask the questions, the next questions, or the follow up to that previous question? You can ask anything you like, Greg. This is a free forum, <laughs> yep. free for all. Do whatever you want. There it is. <laughs> Go for it. There's, I, I guess, you've got okay. three more questions. To, to go on with the the uh, um, like where where we just left off there, so I, I feel like a lot of time I'm being nudged, you know, in particular directions. Like things feel good when I'm going on a certain path, and maybe not so good when I feel like I'm going on that path. And uh, I start getting this feeling like, oh, I'm really connected to to the larger system, and like it's helping me out go along on this path. But then I can always second guess myself and say, well, am I just doing this? to satisfy some, uh, you know, some deep desire that's just really only my desire. And so that's where I was getting at too with that question about having subjective interpretation of the universal's feedback. Now, we, so how, how do I really know what, which one it is? Well, the point is you don't need to know. You see, again, you want your intellect to be in charge. You want to know what's going on and who's doing what to you so that you can, you know, you can work it through your intellect. Well, the, the thing is, you will deal with it however you deal with it. Okay, you get a nudge and you say, all right, I've gotten these three nudges in a row. Stuff just happened, kind of set me up for this. And is this really the system that's doing this or not? Well, that's your ego talking. It doesn't matter. Is it taking you in a place that's good? Is, are there benefits? Does it, you know, is, is it, is it helping you learn? Is it, is it on a growth path or is it not? That's the right question. Who's doing it and why is not the right question. That's an ego question. That's a fear-based question. The fear is what if I'm just leading myself astray? I'm thinking I'm getting all these nudges and I'm, you know, I'm spiritual. I'm going down this path. And what if I'm just a fool, you know, and this stuff happens and I'm just interpreting it that way. And none of this stuff is really, you know, happening to me at all. I'm just, I'm just making it up. That's the fear, the fear of being wrong, the fear of making a fool of yourself, the fear that it isn't real. The point is it doesn't matter. You see, if you get nudges and you follow the nudges, and the nudges pay off for you, 
Does it matter where they come from? Does it matter whether you made them up, whether the, you know, the larger conscious system delivered them itself, or whether it sent a messenger, or whether it was just dumb luck? It really doesn't matter. And if you get nudges and you follow them, they don't go anywhere. Well, does it matter that the larger conscious system did that, or it was just your imagination? No, you, you need to follow your intuition. Follow your intellect, follow your intuition. You realize probably by now that your intellect doesn't have all the answers, that intuition is a very important part of your process. Well, if that intuition hits you as a nudge, then do it. Go with it. See where it leads you. If it leads you to step in a hole that otherwise you would have missed, then next time you get that nudge, ignore it because it's just showed you that you can't count on those nudges, you see. If uh, you get a nudge and it leads you to a better place, then go with that and accept it and go on. So then you may find out, well, you know, some of the time when I get nudges like this, I end up falling in a hole afterwards. And when I get nudges like that, it ends up working out. Now you've become able to discriminate a little bit between these nudges. Before, they were all just one kind of thing because they were new to you and you couldn't discriminate. But you can't discriminate without data without information, you see? So the problem that people make is they want to discriminate right away. Oh, I got a nudge. Where'd that come from? I can't tell. Oh, if I can't tell, well, what good is it? You know, maybe it's bad. Maybe it isn't. I can't make a decision. What if I'm a fool? And they get all this fear and anxiety stuff worked up and they're basically frozen. They can't do anything. They're like the deer caught in the headlight. They're stuck. So the thing is to just do it. It may drop you in a hole one day. Well, be aware of it. You'll learn things. You know, you learn stuff. And if it drops you in a hole, then say, mm, well, okay, I wonder if they all are going to drop me in a hole. And then maybe some of them won't. If they all do, then say, well, if it feels like that, I'm not doing that anymore. That's a nudge to do the opposite of. So you just learn. But until you've done this a hundred times, you don't have enough data to discriminate between what works and what doesn't. You see, if, if on the first few times it happens, you start second guessing it, then all you're doing is getting in the way of it ever being of any value to you. So you just go with it. Use your intuition. Eventually, you will find more confidence in your intuition because you'll be able to discriminate thoughts that just pop into your head because it's random noise in your mind that said, uh, you know, you should do this or you should do that. And you'll find that that random stuff you know, doesn't work out as much as it does. And you'll be able to discriminate that from the stuff that's really purposeful nudges. But you probably can't discriminate that now because you don't have enough data. And you don't have enough data because every time you start to follow something, you start, you know, second guessing it. And uh, you don't know whether this or that. And you kind of throw up your hands of who can tell and who can know. And it uh, that's not a good way to collect data. So first, don't be judgmental. Just collect the data. See what happens. After you've collected hundreds of points of data, now you can be a little judgmental. You can go back and look at it and say, all right, what, what am I experiencing here? What's the good part? What's the bad part? What's the random part? And where is it coming from? And eventually, you'll be smart enough to separate all that out. And then the good part, you can just focus on that. You don't have to worry about the other part because you'll know what that is. So most people just don't give it enough. They don't give it enough rope to or give it enough you know, run to collect enough data to become wise in its use. Because they want to know that intellect doesn't want to be made a fool of. They don't want to waste their time following up bogus stuff. You know, is this a belief or is this real? Not a good question. Not in the beginning. After you've had hundreds of data points, now ask that question. Am I getting, is this valuable? Is it taking me somewhere good or is it not? You see, now you need to be judgmental about that. If the answer is not, or it's random, as much no as yes, then that'll tell you something. Now you need to, to maybe pay more attention, uh, maybe uh, get your nudges in meditation or something else where you have less noise in your mind. You may want to you know, just do things a little differently and see how that works out. But life is an experimental process. You just try it out and see what happens rather than trying to use that old intellect as the master to tell you whether this is a good path or not. Just be an experimentalist. Just go do it and see how that works for you rather than 
I'll figure this out. I need, you know, if I knew that this was an actual bona fide certified, you know, nudge by the larger consciousness system, well, certainly I would do it. But otherwise, I don't want to be a fool leading myself on. You see, that immediately stops the process. You don't let the process happen if you go, if you go there. It's the fear of being the fool, fear of of being misled, the fear that all this stuff isn't real. Part is it doesn't matter how real it is. Just go experiment with the data, then decide how real it is later. Decide, well, not really how real it is. Decide how valuable it is, is the, is the point. <laughs> it doesn't matter how real it is. It's how valuable it is. If it's totally unreal, but it's valuable, <laughs> you're better off. You're doing fine. It's valuable. You know, if it's totally real, but it's not valuable, then who cares? See, whether it's real or not just isn't important. It's the wrong question to ask. It's where is it taking you? How is it helping you? Does it feel right? Does it feel wrong? Go with it. Always be uh, both open-minded and skeptical. You see, if you're always skeptical, you won't go but so far down that la-la land path because your skepticism will catch you sooner or later. And don't be afraid of walking partway down it and then realizing that it wasn't a real, you know, it wasn't a very productive path to be on. Back up. Take another path. So you don't have to know. Your intellect doesn't have to be in charge. You just experience. Just be and experience and make your choices and see what happens. Try to be as best and, and as caring as you can and just see where it leads you. If it leads you in good places, we won't bother about who said it or where it came from or whether it was certified or vetted or not from the source. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. If it doesn't work, let it go. Do something else. Thanks, Tom. And I will say that as, as I've started to started to take that advice and do this type of thing, that it, uh, life has gotten a little more fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are our own worst enemy. It's not that, that this growing up thing and, and becoming uh, more aware and the larger conscious system is really such a such a hard thing to learn. What's hard is, is what we have to unlearn, not what we have to learn. That's uh, the way it normally works. We have to unlearn that, uh, you know, the, the, this intellect has to rule everything. And unless we're sure ahead of time, the uncertainty frightens us. We need to be sure ahead of time about what we're doing. And it's just a fear of the unknown. We don't like uncertainty. <laughs>